have come to the final hour of our seminar. Remember its title? Righteousness by Faith in the End Time. In this hour, we are going to try to tie together all that we have been talking about during the past several hours. What does it mean that we are to be righteous by faith in this time, the very end of time, the time in which we are living? Our final subject deals with the concept of perfection. This word is much misunderstood these days. Many are saying that it is impossible to be perfect. We are going to try to understand from the Bible once again the meaning of this concept. But before we do that, we need to understand as clearly as we can our definitions so that we are speaking the same language and that we are talking about the same ideas. Sin basically has two definitions. Sin can be defined either as definition one, the nature we're born with, or definition number two, the choices we make. I have stressed over the course of this seminar that I believe the biblical definition of sin is that it is the choices that we make, definition number two. And based on that foundation, a gospel of salvation is built, how Jesus saves from that sin, the sin of our willful choices against God in rebellion to him. Now, sinlessness is exactly the opposite side of the coin of sin. Whatever we define sin to be, sinlessness will be the opposite of it. Therefore, sinlessness will have two possible definitions as well. We can define sin as our sinless nature, or we can define it as our sinless character, based on the choices we make. If we define sin as sinlessness as nature, we will never have a sinless nature until the second coming of Christ, when our natures are changed. If, on the other hand, we define sinlessness as character, then we can have a sinless character at whatever point we choose on this earth before the second coming of Christ. So I believe the correct definitions of sin and sinlessness are choice and character rather than nature. Now, the word perfection is a little more complicated because I have found at least four different definitions for the concept or the idea of perfection, and I'm going to put them on the board as we discuss them. The first concept, as we discuss perfection, that some sometimes is used, is the concept of absolute perfection. Absolutely perfect, without flaw, without mistake, without any kind of erroneous judgment, any kind of error at all. Absolutely perfect. Now, the only one, the only being that I know of that qualifies for that definition is God himself. Even the angels, even the ones who were created by God with perfect natures, were not absolutely perfect in their judgment as is determined by the fact that a third of them fell from heaven. And even the ones who remained had to have their questions answered about the character of God and of Satan right up until the cross. No, the only one who is absolutely perfect now and for all eternity is God himself. Even those who are redeemed will not be absolutely perfect because they will be growing all during the years of eternity. So the word absolute perfection really does not apply to anything that pertains to us in our human situation. Now, another definition of sin, another way of, 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 of talking about perfection, rather, another definition of perfection is nature perfection. Now, what does that mean? At birth, We receive, not by choice, but by heredity, a sinful nature. We are born with a sinful nature. Now, we didn't have any choice in that. That was simply part of our heredity because of the fall of Adam and living on a fallen earth. Now, if we extend this to the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ, we find that at the second coming, what Jesus gives us is a sinless nature, exactly the opposite of a sinful nature. A 
Again, we don't have any real input on a sinless nature because God is going to do the redesigning of our bodies. We don't have any way to tell how our bodies should best work, how our mind should best work. God knows, and he'll put it together in exactly the right combinations. So as far as a sinful nature is concerned, we don't have any input on that before we are born. And as far as a sinless nature is concerned, we don't have any input on that because God does that for us at the second coming. So what we're saying at, at this point is that in this area, the area of our nature the nature we're born with, and the nature we receive. There is no human decision. No human decision involved in the nature we're born with or the nature we, re we are given at the second coming of Christ. So there is a truth to nature perfection. We receive nature perfection at the second coming of Christ. But there is not much we have to say about the whole process. As far as our nature, as far as our basic human equipment is concerned, we have relatively little input on that subject. So what I am suggesting is definition number two, nature perfection, is something that we receive at the second coming of Christ, and it is something that we really don't have much to say about. Which leads us to definition number three. Definition number three says something changes in our character. In our character, when we accept Jesus Christ, we must make a total, a complete surrender of our lives. We cannot hold anything back. We cannot hold parts of our life back so that we are, are keeping part of our, our habit patterns while giving some to the Lord. He asks for all, all of our life. And that is a complete surrender. All that is acceptable in the eyes of God is a complete and total surrender. 100%, no, nothing held back. And yet, that isn't all there is in Christianity. I think we will all agree that the moment of our birth into Christ is just the beginning of our walk with Christ. We are babies in the Lord. Let's put it this way. When we accept Jesus Christ as our, our Savior, we surrender all, all of our lives to Him. Everything about us. We give him everything. The important thing to remember about that is that is all that is required for salvation. God asks no more than a complete surrender of the heart. He does, does not ask for knowledge. He does not ask for wisdom or experience. If we study the, the experience of the thief on the cross, we can understand this. The thief had no time to grow in his religious experience, and yet he was saved in God's kingdom. Why? Because he surrendered all of his life, everything that there was. He held nothing back, and God accepted that surrender, even though there was very little maturity that was developed in that person's life. God doesn't leave us there, though. Most of us live beyond our new birth experience, and God wants us to grow. Let's, again, use this same example. Let's say I've surrendered my whole life to the Lord. I have given Him everything. I haven't held back anything. And I live for perhaps a year more of my life, happy in the Lord, praising God. And then someone comes to me, and reading from the Bible shows me the evidence that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Not the first day, as I had always thought, but God's holy day, at creation is his holy day today. And the evidence is persuasive. It is convincing. But I say, no, I don't really think I want to make that change in my life just yet. I have accepted the Lord as my Savior. I gave him everything. My whole life was in his hands. I didn't hold anything back. Did the Lord accept me? Yes, the Lord accepted me. And now you're telling me that I live my life exactly the same today as I lived it yesterday, and I was saved yesterday? Yes. But today you're saying that because of this evidence that has come to me about the Sabbath, that I am no longer completely surrendered? That I am not in harmony with God's will any longer? I'm doing the same thing I did yesterday, exactly the same today. And that puzzles people. 
why today should be different than yesterday when, exact, when I'm doing exactly the same thing today as I did yesterday. The difference is new light has come. New understanding of God's will. God is a merciful God. He doesn't tell us all of His will right away because He knows that would discourage us completely. And so He gives us a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. And the Sabbath is simply a test of whether I am really surrendered today, like I was yesterday. Yesterday I didn't know about it. Today I know about it. Therefore, my surrender must include a wider circle than it did yesterday. It was acceptable yesterday because of God's mercy. But now it must include the new light that God has shed upon my pathway. And you know that never stops throughout the Christian experience. God is always bringing a new bit of light here and a new bit of light there. And my surrender must widen at every point in my experience until it covers all of the light that God wants to shed on my pathway. And so you see, the quantity of my surrender increases greatly as I walk from day to day in Christ. But the quality of my surrender is always the same. It is total. At each point in my life, it is a total surrender, even though its quantity is increasing every step of the way. So there is a further development in my Christian perfection. My surrender was perfect at the moment I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but my maturity was not perfect fully complete yet. My maturity was not perfect. And so God is going to develop in my experience a maturing growth so that I can reach perfection of character. Not just perfection of surrender, but perfection as maturity. And so that's those are the other two definitions of perfection that we need to put on the board. We are guilty. Guilt comes not because of our nature, not because of our equipment, but because of sinful choices. We stand condemned before God. We stand under condemnation because of the choices we make that are sinful choices, rebellious choices. Now, once again, God doesn't leave us in this position any more than he leaves us with a sinful nature. This sinful nature removed, of course, at the second coming. But right now, God wants to do something with my choices. He wants to remove my guilt. He wants to remove the condemnation that I bear. And so perfection, the word that we are discussing, has two important different meanings here. It means character surrender... which is all that God ever requires for salvation, a perfect surrender, a complete surrender. That removes the guilt. That removes the condemnation. When the surrender is there, God accepts that, the blood of Christ is imputed to my account, and my guilt is forgiven. Now, I still have a sinful nature, and I will continue to have that sinful nature until the second coming of Christ. But the guilt is removed. The guilt is gone because of character surrender. But God does not leave me there either. God wants to develop character surrender into character maturity in which I grow and understand the fullness of my experience in Jesus Christ. Character surrender inevitably must lead to character maturity. And this is the fourth definition of perfection that I find in the Bible. Perfection, which is surrender, leads to maturity, which is a fully developed character. And once again, the key point of this line of definitions, this aspect, what we are saying about all of these is that human decision is involved in every step of the process. In contrast to my nature, in which no human decision is involved, this area of maturity and surrender involves my decision at every step of the process. In everything that I do, I am deciding on a new basis every day whether or not I will choose to surrender to the Lord, whether or not I will choose to grow in the Lord, and how He will live in my life and my experience. And so it is this last area, 
this, these, these last two definitions that I wish to focus on in the few moments remaining to us. We need to talk about our characters. We can't do much about our natures. We can do absolutely nothing about absolute perfection, but we can do a great deal about character surrender and character maturity. As we discuss this topic, I'm going to try to ask and answer two questions. Two questions, and they're simple questions. They're not complex. Number one, does the Bible really teach character maturity, character perfection, sinlessness of character? That's the first question. The second question is, if character surrender is all that God requires for salvation, then why should I even trouble myself with character maturity or character perfection? What's the purpose of it? Why bother with it? If God accepts surrender as all that he needs for my entrance into heaven, then isn't character maturity a bit redundant? Why should I even discuss it at all? That's the second question. We'll deal with them in that order. The first question, does the Bible teach character perfection, character maturity, sinless character? Let's go first to Jude, that little book tucked away just before the book of Revelation. The 24th verse of Jude, which is only one chapter long, says something just marvelous as it concludes uh, the little letter that, that he is writing. Jude 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now that's a promise from God. And it's a promise that says he is not only able to forgive our sins, which is marvelous in itself, but he is able to keep you from falling. That's talking about victory over sin. To present us faultless before the throne of God. Well, then if we're not faultless and if we're falling, whose fault is it? Is it God's fault? Is it our nature's fault? Or is it our fault by choice? if we're falling constantly, because God has promised that he's able to keep us from falling. Let's go a little farther to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. My friend, if we're delivered out of a temptation, what have we not done? We haven't fallen under it. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. So if a temptation comes to us, and we are delivered from it by God's own ways and methods, then we have not succumbed to it. We have not sinned. A step farther, each one of these texts will say something just a bit stronger and just a bit more explicit. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, is one of the most marvelous promises I have found in the New Testament. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. That's good news. I am not singled out for special temptations. We are all in the same boat together. But God is faithful, who will not suffer, that means allow, you to be tempted above that ye are able. There's good news also. God isn't going to allow Satan to move in against us with temptations that are bigger than our capacity to deal with. God weighs and measures the temptations that he allows Satan to bring to us. He will only allow those to come that are commensurate with our particular character development at that particular time. It says, He will not allow you to be tempted above that ye are able. No temptation will come to us which is beyond our present capability to deal with. And here is the way to deal with it. But will, God will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. That's how we deal with temptation. Not by fighting with all our human strength against that particular temptation. We will fail every time. But the way, finding the way of escape, finding the way that God has placed for us to escape next to that temptation that he has allowed Satan to bring to us. What is the way of escape? I have found the simplest way of escape for me is on my knees as quickly as possible, figuratively or literally, but in prayer with God.
I have found that it is hard to sin while in prayer with God. It is hard to rebel because there is power. I don't have the power to say no to temptation, but I have the ability to choose to fall on my knees and ask God for that power. And God can supply the power that I'm lacking. With the temptation, God will make a way to escape. Now, a simple question. If we find and use the way of escape for every temptation that comes to us, how many sins will we be committing? The only way we can sin is by refusing the way of escape, is by ignoring it, is by trying to do it our way rather than God's way. The temptations will come, that's guaranteed. But will we accept the way of escape? That's the issue. Again, the simple question, if we take the way of escape, will we be sinning? Let's go to another text, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. And right here is a promise that my faith finds very difficult to accept at full value. I am going to challenge you to believe this text, not because it sounds plausible or reasonable, but because God says it. It's almost beyond my capability to believe. Listen carefully to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, Paul, you really didn't mean that, did you? That's a little bit strong, after all. I can say most thoughts, a good share of the time. But Paul, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ? Will we believe the apostle on this subject? Or will we accuse him of hyperbole, of saying something that really is beyond our capability at this time? I challenge each one of us to stretch our faith, to believe what the Bible says on this point. A simple question again. Was every thought of Jesus in captivity to his heavenly Father? Was it? And we answer, of course, it was. What was the result of every thought being in captivity to his Father? A life of total victory over sin. We call it sinlessness. Paul says, that I can have every thought in captivity to my Father, then what will be the end result of that experience in my life? That's why it's so important to understand that Jesus was faced with the same temptations as we are. He had the same equipment that we had, and he had the same Holy Spirit that we can ask for. And if Jesus submitted every thought to the Holy Spirit on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, that tells us, according to this text, but that can be done in our case. Please notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that every thought will be removed. Not short of the second coming will that be true. Look back at our diagram here. Because we have a sinful nature at birth, we will have thoughts and temptations coming to us that we don't agree with nor like. But at the second coming, when we receive a sinless nature, those will be removed. While we are on this earth, we have sinful natures from our birth to the second coming. And therefore, thoughts will come to us that we did not want or ask for. It is at the second coming that those are removed. What can happen now is every thought can be brought into captivity to Christ. These thoughts that come out of a sinful nature can be surrendered to Jesus. We can give him those thoughts. We don't have the power to deal with those thoughts, but we can surrender those thoughts to him. And then Jesus has promised that he will take those thoughts and he will remove them from us. Then we'll have victory when we give them to Jesus Christ and he holds them in captivity. That's the promise of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Going on to another text, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. First, I'm going to read verse 17 to set the, pay, set the tone here. 
For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. Now, let's look at this carefully. Here we have the flesh, and this means the bodily desires, the sinful nature, if you will. The nature that is within us. This fleshly nature. The flesh desires against the Holy Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. They are not in harmony. They are not in union. They are in opposition to each other. They are separate from each other. They do not combine well. They are a contradiction in terms. The flesh and the spirit. The fallen nature and the Holy Spirit. They are in opposition to each other. Please notice that. Here we're dealing with one of the main principles of God's universe. God and sin do not coexist. That's the reason that we still have a bit of time left on this earth in which we can make our choices is because God has pulled his glory away from this earth. And now he speaks through intermediaries, through prophets, through messengers. What would happen if he would come in all his glory? Well, we know what will happen. After the millennium, he will come back to this earth in all his glory. And what happens? This earth is burned up and all sin is destroyed. God and sin do not coexist. That's the principle. It's as firm a principle as is any principle of physics, such as the law of gravity that we know of today. God and sin do not coexist. And that's what we're reading in this verse. The flesh, which is sin, and the spirit, which is God, do not coexist. They are contrary, the one to the other. They are in opposition to each other. They do not come together. Now verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There it is. Walk in the Spirit. Walk under the control of Jesus Christ, and ye won't fulfill these desires of the fallen nature, because they're opposite. Where one is in power, the other is out of power. Where the other is in power, the first one leaves. And so we have an either-or situation here. It is very simply put in some words that I have treasured from my early education. Christ in, sin out. Sin in, Christ out. That's what we're reading here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Fulfilling the lust of the flesh is sin. That's what sin is, to fulfill the desires of the fallen nature according to James 1, 14 and 15. To fulfill the desires of the fallen nature is sin. And when sin is in the life, Christ is not in control of the life. He is knocking at the door. He is pleading for entrance. But he is not controlling the life. The teaching of many is that Christ and sin coexist in the same life. As long as we love the Lord, as long as we want to be part of the Lord, He will stay there even though we are sinning against Him. And this text is telling us, no, walk in the Spirit. Walk under the control of Jesus Christ. Live in a born-again relationship with Him. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You will not. You cannot. Because God and sin do not coexist. He has expelled sin from the life. But when we choose to let sin come back in and live in our lives and control our lives, then the, regretfully Jesus Christ has to leave the throne of the life. It is an either-or situation. And perhaps the clearest text on this point is one in 1 John. The letter again that John wrote, the letters that John wrote very near the end of his life as he tried to summarize everything about his experience with the Lord. 1 John chapter 3. Starting with verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Where? In my heart. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. There's the key. 
to the one who is truly in a born-again relationship with the Lord, while his connection with the Lord is firm and solid, he cannot sin. Because sin is impossible in a relationship with the Lord. Sin is only possible when we separate ourselves from the Lord. That's when we can sin. And that's never a safe position to be. Ellen White has made this point crystal clear in the little book, Messages to Young People, page 114 and 115. The willful commission of a known sin silences the witnessing voice of the Spirit. Now, that's not many willful commissions of that known sin. The willful commission of a known sin silences the witnessing voice of the Spirit and separates the soul from God. Whatever may be the ecstasies of religious feeling, we may cover up our sin. We may rationalize our sin away. We may say it isn't so bad. Look at Abraham. He sinned. Look at Peter. Look how he sinned. I'm no worse than they are. Whatever may be the ecstasies of religious feeling, we can cover up our sin. We can go to church. We can sing and we can praise the Lord to cover it up. Jesus cannot abide in the heart that disregards the divine law. Prayer and, and, and praise are not proof of a surrendered heart. The Pharisees prayed often. Whatever may be the ecstasies of religious feeling, Jesus can't abide in the heart that disregards the divine law. We cannot for one moment separate ourselves from Christ with safety. And how do we separate? The willful commission of a known sin. We cannot for one moment separate ourselves from Christ with safety. We may have his presence to attend us at every step, by o but only by observing the conditions which he has himself laid down. My friend, let us not treat sin lightly. Let us not casually say, well, it's common to all of our experience. We really can't help it. It's just there with us. Let us look at sin in the way we'd look at a fearsome noise in our car as we are traveling down the freeway. When things start rattling and banging in our engine, do we say, oh, well, that's just the way cars operate, and we'll just drive it a hundred more miles, and then all those noises will disappear? Or should we stop the moment we hear the first sound of danger, investigate and correct that problem? Isn't that what we do? Then why don't we do that in our spiritual lives? Recognize sin for what it is, a danger signal, a signal that we are separating ourselves from the Lord, that while we are in that condition, we are not saved. And recognize that that needs to be corrected immediately. You see, it is true that we have tendencies to fall under temptation more often than we'd like. And we slip. The devil catches us at a weak moment. The key point is, what do we do when we are caught in that slip? What do we do, for instance, when things go badly in our morning um, time together and as a family? And there are harsh words spoken, and we walk out the door to work. Do we hold those feelings in our heart, those feelings of anger and resentment? Do we say, I'll say I'm sorry only if she says she's sorry? And do we carry those thoughts with, with us all the rest of the day and let them ferment? And when we come home, then do we build right upon the spot where we started that morning? Or the moment those things happen, the moment the harsh word is spoken, do we recognize it for what it is, a sin which is separating us from our Lord? And do we correct it immediately? Do we say, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. I exhibited the spirit of Satan right then. See, that's the issue at stake. How do we see sin? As a normal part of our Christian experience, to be gotten rid of somehow in the second coming or maybe before the second coming gradually? Or do we see it as a red flag, a danger signal, every time it happens in our life and take steps to correct it? Take steps to bring that thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. That's the issue. Does the Bible teach victory? over sin? Does the Bible teach that when we are in Christ, we do not sin? Does the Bible teach character perfection? I submit that it does. I want to share with you just a few statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on this very point that I think will be of some help. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 144. We can overcome. 
Yes, fully, entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation, and sit down at last with him. Not many things left out there, are there? Every one. Desire of Ages 123. Not even by a thought did he, Christ, yield a temptation. So it may be with us. There's a promise for us. Do we believe that? Not even by a thought can we yield to temptation, just as Christ. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 82. Through the plan of redemption, God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait and resisting every temptation, however strong. There is a plan. There is a way that we can resist every temptation that comes to us. And then this marvelous statement in Heavenly Places, page 146. Everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. Put that together with another one, which comes from Review and Herald, April 1, 1902. He, Christ, came to this world and lived a sinless life that in his power his people might also live lives of sinlessness. What are we finding from the words of inspiration? That sinlessness is possible or impossible? Look again. We won't have a sinless nature until the second coming of Christ. The Bible says that we can have character surrender right now at the moment of, of, of new birth, and we can have character maturity. And we have just found the word sinlessness applied to that by Ellen White. Sinlessness, right now, if we choose it. We can never have a sinless nature on this earth, but we can have a sinless character on this earth before the second coming of Christ. That's why I said that sinlessness is best defined as our character rather than our nature. We can have, according to the Bible and according to the spirit of prophecy, a sinless experience with the Lord today, which Jesus had, if our thoughts are surrendered to him as Jesus' thoughts were surrendered. Now, how? What's the method? What is the way of doing this? How can we experience this impossible dream? God's Amazing Grace, page 230. Listen carefully. This may be the most important statement of this entire seminar. Our Savior does not require impossibilities of any soul. He expects nothing of his disciples that he is not willing to give them grace and strength to perform. All right. Does he expect of us character maturity? Does he expect of us living without sinning? From the statements we have read, yes, he does. He expects nothing that he is not willing to give them grace and strength to perform. Here is the key sentence. He would not call upon them, that's us, to be perfect if he had not at his command every perfection of grace to bestow on the ones upon whom he would confer so high and holy a privilege. Then is perfection a burden that we have to carry around and say, why, why do I have to be perfect? Martin Luther didn't have to be perfect. My parents didn't have to be perfect. But just because I live in the last generation, I'm supposed to be perfect. I don't read that in this statement, that perfection is a burden. I read that it's a privilege. And further, that he would not ask me to be perfect if he didn't have every perfection of grace to bestow on me, then what is perfection? It is just as much a gift of God's grace as is forgiveness. It is not something I work up. It is not something with all my willpower I achieve. It is the gift of God's grace. Now let's look at it just a moment. Are we glad for the gift of forgiveness? Do we rejoice that Jesus has forgiven our sins? Do we say, please, Lord, don't take that gift away from me. I want it. I want your gift of forgiving mercy every step of my life. And Jesus says, I'm glad to give it to you. I will give it to you as often as you ask for it. But you know, I have a better gift to give you too. Better than the gift of forgiveness even. It's called 
the gift of overcoming. It is called the gift of enabling power. Do you want that gift also? And how many of us seem to turn cartwheels to escape from that gift because the price is too high? We want desperately the gift of forgiving grace, but we're not so sure about enabling grace. We're not so sure about overcoming grace. It's all grace. It's all God's power. But it does different things. Now, is it really the better gift? Is enabling gift better than forgiving grace? Is it enabling grace better than forgiving grace? What about the man who comes home after a Friday, hard week at work, a bit discouraged, having some tendencies within himself that are a little stronger than his connection with the Lord, and before he knows that he finds a bar, he finds some friends, and he's lost in drink. And that evening when he gets home, his family finds him not a compassionate father. He yells at his wife. He even physically threatens her. She tries to protect the children. The children are threatened and perhaps slapped. And there is much unhappiness in that home. Sunday morning, the father wakes up from his drunken stupor, realizes what he has done. The money is gone. The family is distressed. There is much uh, discouragement. And he says, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Does the Lord forgive him? Of course. The Lord forgives an honest and repentant heart. And the Lord can help put that family back together. And it's a marvelous gift. But now, let's... Take the picture back. Let's run the cameras back to where they were. What if coming home on that Friday afternoon, the man prays before he passes that bar? And he says, Lord, I know my weaknesses, and I know that you can help me. Please, Lord, come into my life and help me to walk past that bar this afternoon, even though things haven't gone well this week. And the Lord enables him by his grace to walk past the bar. And instead of putting his money there, he buys a picnic lunch. And the family enjoys a picnic lunch together. No recriminations, no threatenings, no bitter words, no fear. No need for forgiveness. Which is the better gift? Which is the better gift? Clearly, it is enabling grace. It is power then why don't we accept that gift with as much eagerness as we accept the gift of forgiveness? God wants to give it to us. He wants to give us that gift. He wants to give us the gift of overcoming today. The first question I asked, remember? Does the Bible teach Christian perfection of character? Does the Bible teach sinless character? I am going to suggest that it does. By God's methods, in God's way, by His grace, God can perfect the character of His people. That was question number one. But question number two is the one we want to conclude with today. If all that is required for my salvation is surrender, then why do I even talk about this gift of sinlessness? Why do I even mention it? Why do I bring it up? Isn't it just extra? A nice thing to have, but not essential, if all that's required is my surrender. Remember that text we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13? It said that God did not allow Satan to bring upon us all the temptations that Satan wants to bring upon us. In fact, it says, if you remember, that God will not allow us to be tempted above our abilities. Do you think Satan is happy with that arrangement? Or do you think he's desperately angry? And he says to God, you claim that this is a fair controversy, but then you won't even let me tempt your people. You have a hedge around them. You protect them. You won't let me near them. That's why you win. And God says, you have a point, Satan. I do protect my people. You can't do what you like to them. We will have a test case. Do you remember the test case? It's the story of Job in which the barriers were removed. Satan could do whatever he wanted to Job, save take his life. And the temptations came thick and fast. And Job struggled for his very spiritual existence. 
He didn't know what was going on and why, until finally he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And he had the victory. Total surrender and total trust. Satan was beaten. But you know, Satan is a very wise general. When he is beaten, he doesn't concede defeat easily. He backs away, tries a new tack, and he says something like this, All right, you got me with Job, and then there was Jesus Christ and Enoch and some others, but you know, God, you've only had a few heroes of faith. You've only had a few that have withstood me in my temptations. Most of them have succumbed to me. You know, God, that if you were to follow around your professed Christians today and we would write down who they like better on a day-by-day -day basis, they will like me more than they like you, God. They obey me more than they obey you, even though they claim to, to, to believe in you. And God once again says, Satan, you have a point. And so God has said something that is beyond my ability to imagine. It's in chapter 7 of Revelation, verses 2 and 3. God says that he is going to give his angel a special commission. In verse 3, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand. God says, I will not only find a hero of faith here and there, I will find a whole generation, garden variety Christians, not heroes of faith. And I will seal them with my seal. Now, what's that seal? Revelation chapter 14 describes those who are sealed with this seal, the 144,000. On the Mount Zion are 144,000 having his Father's name written in their foreheads. That's what the seal of God is. The seal of God is not, my friends, a cage to lock us in from the protect, to protect us from Satan so he can't get to us anymore. On the contrary, we will be in the experience of Job when all the bars are removed and Satan has free access to us. The seal is not a protection against temptation. The seal is not a barrier to Satan's temptations, but the seal is God's name written on our forehead saying, This man will not sin again. This woman will remain loyal to me, no matter what Satan does to them. That's what the seal is. Verse 5 describes these people who are sealed with God's seal. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. No guile, no deception, no fault, no sinning in their lives. No matter what Satan does to them, no matter what he throws at them. And this is what God has put on the line in the great controversy. God has said, I will find and I will seal a whole generation of those who profess to love me. And once they have been sealed, I promise that they will not sin again. Not by my turning a switch in their minds, but by, their ye but by them yielding themselves totally to me. Ellen White has an interesting statement on this very point. It's in Desire of Ages, page 671. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. What's at stake? Not my salvation. Not me and whether or not I grow or don't grow. What is at stake is God's good name. Remember, who does the perfecting? Do I do the perfecting? Or does God give me the grace of overcoming? Does God bestow on me the gift of perfection? Then if I'm not perfect, whose fault is it? It's God's. Somehow, God didn't do his job well enough. If he has done all for me and I'm still sinning after I have been sealed, then Satan will say, look, God, where is your good name? You promised that that person would never sin again. And see, I caught him sinning. And God's name is gone. And the credibility of God is gone. And the great controversy is lost. That's the issue at stake. That's what's going on right now. Why? Why do I talk about character maturity and sinlessness when the issue of salvation has to do only with surrender? Because I am not talking about salvation at all. I am not talking about how I am saved. 
I am talking about the victory of God in the great controversy and God's good name. And God's good name can only be defended and protected on the basis of a perfectly mature and sinless people at the end of time. Because God has promised it to be so. Why do we talk about perfection of character? Because our interest is not in our personal salvation from sin. Our interest is in the victory of God in the great controversy. Whether we're saved or lost is not the issue that we concern ourselves with anymore, not at the end of time. The issue is, does God win the great controversy and can sin come to an end once and for all? Only if God is proved true and Satan is proved a liar can that happen. That's why we talk about character maturity. That's why we talk about a sinless character. That's why it's crucially important, because the issues of the great controversy are at stake. I don't believe God is going to lose the great controversy at the end of time. I believe that he is going to win, but that means something very important. He will wait until he finds a people that are willing to surrender totally to him. He tried to do it a hundred years ago. He could not. Therefore, he waited. He is coming to us today. He is asking the same question. Are you willing to do it this time? I am ready to do it with you. Now the decision is totally ours. Will we say yes to God and go all the way through on this one with him? Or will we pull back just as our forefathers did 100 years ago and refuse to yield ourselves completely to him? If we do, he will pull back again, and he will wait for another generation to do what we have failed to do. My friends, I want it to be this generation. I want it to be now. I want it to be the time in which we are living that God can end sin on this planet. And so my appeal is not the appeal of an evangelist. An evangelist would ask, are you saved? Is your heart right? My appeal is a different appeal. I am asking, are you willing to put yourself so completely in God's hands in every way that he, that he can seal you with his seal? That your character will be developed to that point where it is so mature that it is impregnable to the assaults of Satan? Will you, will I, be willing to go that far with God? Will you accept the challenge of being the possible last generation ever to live on the face of this earth? If you are, I challenge you and I ask that you go to your closets in prayer and on your knees make your commitment to the Lord that you are willing to be that final generation, that you are willing to let everything go in your life that is out of harmony with His will, that you are willing to let, those, let the Holy Spirit come so totally into your life that nothing is left but Jesus Christ. As we conclude this seminar, that is my appeal. I want us to know about righteousness by faith in the end of time. And I'm going to ask, as we conclude this, that we put our hearts before the Lord. And I want to put my heart before the Lord on this also. And I'm going to do this in prayer. But remember, my prayer is not what will solve the issue. It is the prayer of countless thousands of God's people around the world praying the same prayer that will allow it to happen. Our prayer needs to be the prayer of willingness to be nothing for the Lord, willingness to give him everything so that we are nothing. And I want us to do that as we kneel in prayer and give him our total life right now. O oh Lord, as we come to the end of this seminar, have talked about many things having to do with sin and righteousness, help us to see that all that matters is the victory of Jesus in the great controversy. All that matters is that God's good name be glorified. O oh Lord, take my life. May it be the life that thou canst use, a garden variety Christian, but nevertheless one who wants to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that nothing else is there. O oh, Father, forgive our backsliding, forgive our rebelliousness, and may it be through this generation that the impossible can be accomplished. A people can be prepared to stand without sin and be sealed with the seal of God forever. Thank you, Lord. Amen.